Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live. And you may think, oh my God, it's did I miss the whole morning? Is it lunchtime already? No, well, we decided that, because some people have commented to, to us that when we do things at 12 or 1 o'clock, they're in Australia, it's 2 in the morning. If they're in Europe, it's 8 o'clock at night. And so we thought we'd share some of the, um, I'm not sure, pain or whatever, but we would do it 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm always here by 6.45 or so. Um, so it's not a big deal for us. And Lily came in very nicely to help set everything up. So we're here and we hope everybody is enjoying, the, will enjoy this time and we'll figure out if this is a good thing to do. I guess some of you could be driving to work so you can listen to it in your car. And there's no perfect time. I have to admit, um, I was in Australia speaking at the Red A meeting a few weeks ago. And then you realize that it's 14 hours ahead of us. So it's already tomorrow in Australia. And so it's really hard. It's interesting that one of the great things about the web and education on the web is that you could be everywhere for anybody. We have 210, 220 countries where Facebook or CTSS, the website or Instagram is being used, but no one's really on the same time. So someone's eating breakfast and someone's eating dinner and someone's eating breakfast like us and someone else is sleeping. So it is kind of interesting. In saying that, um, this is on the incidental renal mass. So I wanted to uh, make some points about renal masses and I'm about to give a um, talk on CTSS. So I've revamped a number of talks and we're redoing the next sequence of talks for the next, uh, let's say two or three months. So we do them in advance. And one of them is gonna be on kidney. I'm gonna go into some of the details about some of the things that we're learning a lot more about the kidney and how to re really triage patients in this era where we have minimal dose. We try to do the minimum number of phases. Also the issue with uh, things like ERs and incidental findings. And when you think about incidental findings, we know, for example, that about two thirds of renal cell carcinomas are picked up by serendipity. You're getting a CT for the pancreas, abdominal pain, you're getting an ultrasound, you're getting an MR, and people pick up a renal mass. Now, in saying that, that's great, but it's important to remember, and we all know that not every renal mass is going to be a renal cell carcinoma, right? So, um, and, and the problem has been that 25% of renal masses uh, over 2CM that are resected have ended up being benign. And so, we would you hate to do, sometimes you just, that's going to happen, but you really would like to minimize the number of people who go to surgery for a mass that is benign. So there's some strategies. One strategy is, of course, when you're looking at a non-contrast CT, and we do get lots of non-contrast CTs in the ER, if you see a renal lesion, you, you need to put a cursor on it. And the rule would be is if you have a well-defined lesion, no funny-looking calcifications or something like that, or nothing that looks like a soft tissue mass, surely, but you have a renal lesion, which kind of in your mind looks like a cyst, perhaps, or where you don't know what it looks like. If it measures under 20, under 2-0 Hounsfield units or over 70 Hounsfield units, it's going to be a either a simple cyst or a high-density renal cyst. Now, obviously, we also look for the presence of fat. One of the most common lesions that's removed incidentally is an angiomyolipoma. Now, an angiomyolipoma is all fat. It's really not a big deal. Then it's a very easy diagnosis. The problem is angiomyolipomas often have a minimal amount of fat. And those are the ones, those lipid-poor angiomyolipomas, they may only have one dot, and you just blow the dot off as maybe a tiny cystic or a necrotic component. You put a cursor there, it's minus 40, and you have a home run diagnosis. Remember that angiomyolipomas don't need to be all fat. If there's a little bit of fat, that's the diagnosis. Now, people have said, well, you know, what about a renal cell that contains fat? Every renal cell I've seen that contains fat is a big, ugly lesion and most of the fat is perinephric fat, perinephric fat that is invaded. So it's not like you're seeing a, a renal mass and you see fat and you make a mistake. No, 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 that's not really going to be an issue. The second thing is people have written articles that make the point that if you have renal cell carcinoma and you would simply measure the non-contrast CT, the average attenuation value is 37. So you see it works out really well. Under 20, over 70, don't sweat it. Over 70 is a high-density renal cyst, as I mentioned. 
but 37 is a critical number. So if you end up and you see a lesion that looks very well defined on CT, you put a cursor there and it measures 40, you need to give IV contrast. So maybe your patient's already gone, you bring them back because that 40 could be a renal cell carcinoma. Now I will admit that 40 or 50 or 60 could be a renal cyst as well because we do see high density renal cysts, but you can't make that assumption. You can't make that the way you diagnose things. You need to go further. That's one thing. The other thing is the issue with patients who've already got contrast. Let's say you have one phase, or even if you have two phases, but let's stick with one phase. Let's say it's 70 seconds, or even if it was 30 second delay, or it was you know, three minute delay, whatever phase you have. If you have one phase, and you see a well-defined lesion and it measures 60 or 80 or 50, you gotta be very careful. It's very easy to look at that lesion, say it's solid, renal cell carcinoma, if it's 50 or 60, you say, well, it's papillary because papillaries are under 90 Hounsfield units. You have to be careful because remember, if you only have one phase with contrast, maybe that's just simply a high density renal cyst and nothing more and nothing less. Well, there's no real way you could really know that, right? So what I would say is I would say, hey, there's a lesion in the kidney. It's three centimeters, four centimeters, measures 50 Hounsfield units. We need to bring the patient back for a dedicated study. Now, if you get a non-contrast scan and it measures 50 as well, then that's easy. One of the things I've noticed also is if you had two phases, if a lesion stays the same between two phases, be it non-contrast and arterial, or arterial and venous, or arterial delayed, venous delayed, it's always gonna be a high density renal cyst or just a, a simple cyst. Regardless whether you're dealing with a papillary renal cell carcinoma or a clear cell, it's, things are gonna enhance by at least 20 Hounsfield units between phases. With clear cell, it's much more because the average clear cell is 150 arterial, so venous is probably 90, papillary, it's probably more like 90 arterial and maybe 70, 80 venous. So the spread is less, but you're still gonna have a spread of 20. So I think that is really going to be a very important way of thinking about things. So those are two of the biggest mistakes I've seen when you have patients who had one phase, incidental finding, they go to surgery for a benign lesion, get rid of that. And the second thing to, to really understand the value of non-contrast CT. We do make the point that non-contrast CT is not routinely needed. You don't need it for liver. You don't need it for pancreas. You need it for like looking at endovascular stents, looking for a leak perhaps. But it's really, really good if you're looking at renal masses. And again, you want to be certain that you're picking up all the renal cells, but you're not overcalling them. And that's a very, very important point. And you need some kind of strategy in your practice because I see all the time mistakes and, and that is very frustrating to the urologist. It's very frustrating to the patient. And at the end of the day, it doesn't make radiology look any better. So that, that's something to really uh, think about. Now, one of the things in terms of the kidneys, um, in terms of injection rate, People do ask me about split injections, and split injection means this. You inject, let's say, 70, 50 cc's, 70 cc's. Then you wait five minutes, and now you have excretion of contrast by the kidney. Then you bolus another 50 or 70, and you get sort of arterial phase. And then the comment is, well, would this be a way of getting rid of phases? And conceptually, conceptually, it seems not unreasonable to do that. And you can make some pretty nice pictures. But I always tell people that when you read the articles, all the articles written on the split bolus, in the last paragraph, somewhere buried in there, it says something like, we did not look at the accuracy of this technique compared to standard techniques in terms of lesion detection. And that's the problem. The main reason we do renal CT is looking for renal masses. If you only wanna look at the vessels, you're looking at a UPJ or you were looking at that, perhaps that's a reasonable strategy. But if you're looking to detect tumors and classify tumors, then to me, that split bolus doesn't work well because some lesions, when you give contrast, become isodense. So it really is problematic. Also, in my lecture, you're going to hear about how we're using the enhancement patterns of tumors 
as a way of predicting both their um, type, papillary versus clear cell, but also as a way of being able to predict their genetic defects, which allow us to predict specifically how the lesions will behave when given chemotherapy, particularly tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there's been a lot of work done on that. And I think one of the big aspects of CT going forward, both with AI, both with radiomics, is this being able to use the density measurements of the kidney, be able to look at enhancement patterns, be able to look at washout patterns, and based on that, determine specifically um, how you need to treat the patient, what patients should get surgery, what patients need chemotherapy, and what patients will do when they get chemotherapy. So one of the things we're looking at, and I think very important is, <coughs> excuse me, but too much dust in here. Um, but one of the things that I think is very important as we go into this era of AI and radiomics, the protocols we use, this is not just for kidney, but it's true in liver, it's true in pancreas. We know this from a lot of the AI stuff we're doing ourselves. The importance of the protocols, the importance of the algorithm you use is going to be critical because things like radiomics, it's very clear that different algorithms will give different results, some good, some bad. It's very clear that slice thickness will impact that. It's very clear that using dual energy or not will impact that. It's very clear that the dose reduction techniques you use will affect that. So we're going to have to come to an era where we really think about our protocols in that scenario, that we need to make things a little bit more standardized because otherwise all that radiomic stuff is not going to work. Uh, now, the people are looking at ways of trying to say, can we take different parameters and run some algorithms and then make everything the same? And perhaps that's a way uh, of doing it, but that's going to take a while. There was an article in radiology looking at that with lung nodules where it looked at standard and high res, and they were able to take the high res, run some algorithms, and get it as accurate as the standard for radiomics. But that was one instance, and, and I believe that's also a lot easier because you're talking about simply taking what basically is a high-res algorithm and just kind of smoothing it down. That's, you seem to have control over that. The other stuff I have a little bit more problem with. So I think this ability and this push to be more centric on doing things is going to be very big. Now let me just also say that we have about two or three minutes left. So if anyone has any specific questions, this is probably a good time to answer the questions. Now, we're both, as some of you, as many of you do know, um, uh, there is, uh, we are at Instagram as well as Facebook. It's a little bit easier for me, I have to admit, to see questions on Facebook, but I am looking at the Instagram now. Uh, somebody wants to be in a live video. Uh, well, they come to our fancy studios, Anyone who shows up can be in our live video. We are, oh, I should tell you that we are also going to hopefully be interviewing some really great people. Our speaker series starts up uh, with Lauren Taylor, who's uh, running a company that helps on student debt. We have people speaking about AI and communications and leadership. So we're just going to have a wonderful series of talks this year. So. Uh, also, we do invite people now. It's uh, always at Hopkins. It's at 5 o'clock. First one, September 11th, September 17th, October 2nd, November 13th. Those are our first four lectures. So um, uh, it's 5 o'clock, Chevy Chase Auditorium. Uh, be there or be square. But we welcome people to come to that as well. But let me just finish up also with the kidneys and um, one last thing to mention in terms of excretory phase imaging, and we have made this point before, you always need excretory phase imaging when you're working up hematuria because if you don't do excretory phase imaging, you're going to miss transitional cell carcinomas. Now, sometimes TCCs, when they're large, are easy to see on the early phase imaging. Sometimes, even when they're smaller, they're easier to see when they're located a certain way and they cause perfusion changes. But a lot of TCCs, the ones you want to pick up early, are really small because they do some changes in the calyces, which doesn't really impact the kidneys right away, or the filling defects in the renal pelvis, which are 
hypovascular, which TCCs typically are. So if you want to, you must have late phase imaging. The kidney is one area where you can't skip on protocols. You need the non-contrast, you need the delayed, you argue arterial venous, I think arterial is better, but in older patients with hematuria, we'd be do arterial and venous. You don't need to do arterial and venous of the whole abdomen and the pelvis. You can do on the arterial, we do it all the way down because we wanna make sure we don't miss a bladder cancer. On venous, you can go to the crest. On delayed, you can go, um, obviously you go the whole way through the bladder. And then on contrast, you're only doing through the kidney. So it's really a modified protocol. You use dose reduction techniques. Uh, on some of the newer scanners, we're doing 90 or 100 kVp, which usually works out very nicely. So there's a number of things you can do. So that hopefully will help you a little bit. Again, as you go to work today or you go to sleep, wherever you are, hopefully that will be helpful. And again, we have a really good series of new lectures on the kidney. I think it's going to be a three-part lecture. I probably will do it today. I'm doing liver and kidney. I just put together these really updated talks. There'll probably be three-part lectures. Uh, I'm not sure which one I'm going to do first. Depends what kind of mood I'm in. But if no one has any questions, I guess we'll stop there. I'll we'll have to see. Let us know if you like this being earlier in the morning, if you like going to work. or uh, There's no perfect time, we know, but um, hopefully this will work. And with that, we'll see you later. Have a great day, wherever you are. Bye-bye.